If you have a Bible, would you open it up with me to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12. We uh, are resuming on in in our series this morning as we've been uh, doing now for, gosh, almost a year, walking through this letter to the Hebrews chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And if you're new or you're visiting or you're joining us online, welcome. It's really good to have you. We've uh, covered a lot in this book, but we're kind of coming to the conclusion now. And this This book, or as I've said from the beginning, this sermon that this pastor, the author of the Hebrews, who remains anonymous, is preaching to a church that is in a precarious situation, a church that has uh, the temptation of sort of giving up uh, the threats of persecution or the pressures of coalescing with the world, going along to get along, is uh, always pressing in on them. And so we saw last week that the elder uh, or the leader here of the, of the church, the, the, the pastor, preaches and tells the church, okay, since we have, as we saw in chapter 11, such a, a testimony of witnesses, of those who've gone before us all throughout the Old Testament with this one thread that ties it all together, the, the thread of faith, since we have that testimony and we saw that even though for many of them they died, many of them suffered Many of them were were put to death for for their faith. God did something in and through them to to carry on the good news of the gospel, even to us today. And the author says, so because we have that record, and because we have those witnesses, let us then fix our eyes on Jesus. Let us lay aside all the sin that entangles us, fix our eyes on Jesus, run the race that is set before us with endurance. Jesus is the author and the perfecter of our faith. He had joy set before him, so he took on the cross and he scorned its shame. And then in verse 3, the author says, So consider him, consider Jesus, who endured such hostilities from from sinners against himself, so you don't grow weary and lose heart. And the author said that's sort of the the main point here. That's the thing that we're seeking to avoid, this this giving up, this uh, caving in, this, this getting so tired, so overwhelmed, so anxious that we don't see how we can move forward. And so in order to make progress in this way, the author says, fix your eyes on Jesus, consider him. Oh, by the way, you need to rethink how it is that the Lord is going to sanctify you. The Lord uses a tool to make us into people who look and act and even smell a bit like Jesus, it's called discipline. And he uses his discipline to shape us and to form our spirits, to, to direct our souls in, in a Godward way so that we, we act like Christ. We become actual disciples. So he has said in verse 3, consider him so you don't grow weary or lose heart. So we pick up in verse 4, and he takes it from there. He says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom the father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we've had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. This is the word of the Lord. Several years back, I got to uh, go on a a bucket list trip with my family to uh, Yosemite National Park. If you've never been, I highly recommend it. If they ever say that people can just live in there and be like, you know, vagrants in a national park, I'm probably gone, y'all, just so you know. I will sleep, sleep at the foot of El Capitan and uh, be a, the happiest man on the planet. I, it's a great place. And so when we went with my family, we wanted to maximize our, our time there and learn as much, nerd out about the park as much as I could. So we got a tour guide. One of the days, he took us down to Mariposa Grove, which is the place where the giant sequoia trees grow. And if you've never seen one of those, again, Google it, but it's even more impressive in person. These things look like they came out of the Lord of the Rings or something. These massive trees that um, just kind of defy the imagination even. And so as we were going on this tour, I was, we were able to ask the guide several questions about the grove and the trees and all these things. And, and someone in our, our group, I think, said, hey, why are there not 
why is this one of the only places where these things are, are, are growing? Like it, it would seem like any type of tree would show up somewhere else. And so he's like, well, there's the soil, there's the, there's the air, there's the altitude. He said, but beyond that, there's a few other features about the giant sequoia tree that we really just found out in the past handful of years. He said, in fact, the National Park Service mis- mismanaged the giant sequoia trees for about 70 years because they didn't understand how they work. And so he, he pointed out on the ground, he said, see those, those pine cones over there? And they were ponderosa pine cones. Ponder, ponderosa pines are really tall trees as well, but they have these giant pine cones. I mean, like, bigger than a football. And he's like, okay, when the ponderosa pine drops its cone, those cones drop, you know, thousands upon thousands of seeds. And so they have a really good chance of growing, and that's why they're all around. But he said, you see that cone over there? And he said, we can't pick it up because it's a giant sequoia cone. And we looked at it, and it's... It was about the size of an egg. And he was like, that's the cone of a giant sequoia. And relative to its size, it's kind of like mind-blowing that this gigantic tree has this little bitty cone. And he said, so for, for about 50 to 70 years, something like that, the National Park Service, the, the giant sequoias, we, we manage them by saying if there's ever a forest fire, and I don't know if you know about California, they seem to have those a lot. If there's ever a forest fire, we got to send all hands on deck to protect the sequoia trees. And so the, the, the rangers, the, the, the firefighters in the park, everyone would go and basically surround the grove with fire hoses because everything can burn but not the sequoia trees because they're, they're so rare, they're so important. He said, but what we found out was that little bitty cone only opens up in really, really hot temperature, like fire temperature. And then we got to see that the bark on the cone is the least resinous bark of any tree on planet Earth that we know of, which means that it's the most fire-resistant tree on the planet. And he was like, so all this time we thought we were protecting the trees by keeping them from encountering fire when in fact we were killing them off. They needed the fire to open up their cones to spread and to grow. And as soon as he said that, I thought, oh man, as a parent, that hits home. (laughs) Because often I see this in myself with my kids. I want to do all that I can to protect them, to guard them, to you know, shelter them, to put them in bubble wrap if I have to, because I want them to be protected, I want them to be cared for. But in fact, perhaps maybe a little bit of fire is a good thing for all of us. Maybe the way that we grow, maybe the way that we mature, maybe the way that that we develop is by being exposed to some pretty hot flames. And that seems to be the heartbeat of what the author of the Hebrews is telling us here in this particular passage, that it is the discipline of God, it is the, the, the fire, the hard stuff, The the trials, the tribulations, the persecutions, the sufferings, it is those things that the Lord uses, and in his hands he can produce. He can reproduce you. He can cause the the discipleship of the church to grow and to flourish and to further itself. He, He makes us and shapes us into the image of Jesus and into his likeness by using very hard things. In this instance, he calls it discipline or chastisement or rebuking or reproof. It's the way that the Lord allows difficult things into our lives in order for us to be shaped and formed and to become more like Jesus himself. Now, I want to show you three things about discipline this morning, the Lord's discipline, and I think we're meant to understand as we encounter suffering and trials, as we walk through hard times, as we feel anxiety or grief or sorrow, as we deal with persecution even perhaps, how we interact with and encounter discipline from the Lord shapes the way that we grow and become more like Jesus. The first thing I want to show you today is the, the, the purpose of discipline. The purpose of discipline. What does the scripture teach us about why the Lord allows these things to happen? And real quick, a disclaimer on that. When I talk about the purpose of discipline, I know many of you came in today with a lot of really hard things. Some things maybe perhaps that feel completely overwhelming, that you feel like there's no resolution for, there's no end in sight, and you don't know how you're going to make it through it. When I talk about the person of discipline, I do not want you to hear me say, Here are some Bible verses that you are supposed to paper over your very deep and hard suffering so that you can get over it. That's not it at all. The scripture gives us these insights into why the the Lord would allow these particular things into our lives so that as we suffer, we can think and consider possibilities beyond what we could ask or imagine about how the Lord may change us, shape us, and mold us into the image and likeness of Jesus. It's not meant to Um, It's not meant to deaden or dull the pain of suffering. It's meant to put it in perspective so that we can better understand who God is, how he works perhaps, 
and what he may have for us at the, the, the end of all of this. The purpose of discipline. Secondly, we'll look at the product of discipline. That if we can endure, if we can do what the author says here, if we fix our eyes on Jesus, if we consider him so we don't grow weary and lose heart, what are the promises that God gives us about what that will produce in our lives? What product is there that, that makes us in, into to, to more of the likeness of Jesus? And how can we look at it and say, yeah, I've, I've endured in a, in a good way. And then lastly, I think the most important piece of all this is the person of discipline. How the author tells us that here that we've got to fix our eyes on Jesus. Otherwise, we don't have a shot, y'all. So the, the, the purpose, the product, and the person of discipline. First off, the purpose. Again, I don't want to attempt to plaster Bible answers onto your particular suffering, but I do think what the author has for us here is really significant if we will sit in it, meditate upon it, and allow it to shape us, especially as we encounter trials, tribulations, sufferings, and persecution. The first thing that he tells us is that the purpose of discipline is to confirm something in us, to, to give us confirmation, namely of our sonship or of our daughtership, of, of, of belonging to God himself. The author jumps in with verse 4 and he says, In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. So <laughs> I mean, the author of Hebrew comes at this one hard, y'all. He says, but did you die? I mean, essentially, he's like, okay, yeah, you've been going through some tough stuff, but you're still alive. You're still alive. So, in fact, you haven't been beaten for anything yet. So let's work with this. Then what do we do with that? Verse 5, have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? And here, referencing from the book of Proverbs, he says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. And then he goes on to say, you know, if you never encounter discipline, if life is just rainbows and unicorns and, you know, songs in a field spinning about, then maybe you're not a son of the Lord. Maybe you're not a son or daughter of God. Because God and his fatherhood of us will take us through these seasons, through these stretches of difficulty in order to shape us and to confirm for us that we are, in fact, sons and daughters. Sons are always going to be disciplined by the Father. So in order for you or I to be shaped into the image and likeness of Jesus, we have to undergo particular challenges and particular sufferings. And one way for you to look at whatever it is you're currently going through to shape it or to frame it in a way that, where it can be healthy and life-giving is to see it through the lens of sonship. How is God confirming to me that I belong to him by taking me through whatever it is that you're currently going through? Just as a loving parent must expose their children to certain trials and, and, and tribulations, must allow them to experience the pain of failure, hopefully under the, the watchful eye of a parent who can coach them through the pain of it all, so too must God do that with us. When you encounter persecution or difficulty or hardship, what, what do you do with that? I don't know. I, I can't tell you why today. I honestly do not know. But I do know this. I do know you are invited to see the challenge that you're encountering through the lens of God's great love for you and the truth that he is parenting you in a way that is filled with grace, even though it may not feel like it. God disciplined those, disciplines those whom he loves, the Proverbs tell us. The author of Hebrews says he's treating you as sons. If you're never encountering discipline, you may not be a child of God. It's about confirmation. But it's more than that. In the quote from the, from the book of Proverbs in verse 6, the, the author references chastisement or reproof. So, so sometimes discipline is not just about confirming something to us. Sometimes it's, about, it's also about correcting something in us. It's about correction. And we see this all throughout the scripture, that when we endure sufferings and challenges, sometimes it's because of our rebellion or our sin. Now, I don't want to be like Job's friends, if you've read the book of Job, that perplexing, paradoxical book of Job where Job is going through immense suffering and his friends show up and they weep with him for a couple of days. That's when they got it right. But then at the end, they're like, hey man, maybe you sinned. Maybe you need to repent of something. Okay, that can be a really unhealthy way to address suffering and challenges and discipline. But we do know from the scriptures that oftentimes God uses discipline in our lives to bring to the surface the stuff that is in our hearts or the sin that is in our lives so that we will turn from it and repent. We see it all throughout the scriptures. We see it most notably in places like where Nathan the prophet confronts David about his sin with Bathsheba 
and then tells him there's going to be consequences for that sin. The Lord is going to discipline you for your rebellion. We see it in, in, in multiple places throughout the Old Testament, the story of Israel, how Israel had to undergo all, all sorts of challenges, the, the wandering in the wilderness, perhaps, a way of God getting the, the Egypt out of their bones or out of their souls as he takes them to the promised land. We see it with Moses, who sins mildly before God and is forbidden to go into the promised land. It's an act of discipline. Over and over and over again, the, the scripture teaches us that sometimes the Lord allows these things into our lives to correct us, to bring us to repentance. When I was 19, I was in a really bad car wreck. I was in college. I was going to see one of my friends. I was driving back to work and driving down the interstate. And it was raining really hard. And the Jeep hydroplaned. And I, my car slid up underneath it whenever I hit it. And so the windshield came in on me. Really messed my face up. My modeling career was over. It was a sad day. But um, messed my face up. Cut my ear all the way off. It was kind of attached to the side of my head. Fractured my sternum. I, I was a mess. And uh, when I was in the hospital, kind of recovering from that, my, my at the time, youth pastor came, came to visit me. And at that moment, I'd been talking to him about some things in my life. I'd gone to college to, to be in the ministry, and I decided I didn't want to do that anymore. I just wanted to go work a job where I could make lots of money. I was kind of done with thinking about ministry or really kind of church at that point in my life. And I had this bad car accident. I'm in the hospital. My youth pastor comes to visit me, and he sees me. And I could tell by the look on his face, like he was not prepared for me being pieced back together like Frankenstein. And, uh, and he kind of leaned in and made a joke. And he said, hey, the Lord took your ear, but he gave it back. Now maybe you can use it to listen to him. <laughs> and at the, the instant that he said it, I was like, uh, you know? <laughs> but he was right. And the Lord used this really painful, literally painful experience in my life to put me back on track, to get me directed back to walking with Jesus and to pursuing what I felt he had called me into. That's what God does. The Lord chastises his sons. He brings discipline into our lives sometimes to correct us, to bring us to repentance. This morning, have you considered that maybe you're going through something that the Lord is trying to bring to revelation in your life? I really want to deal with this. This has gone on for too long. This area of your heart, this, this portion of your life, this thing that's not surrendered, I, 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 want, I, I want that from you. I want, I want growth for you. I want, I want you to be more like Christ in this way. And so I'm going to allow you to go through these things in order to bring you to a place where perhaps you'll come to a place of repentance and surrender. Third, uh, the other reason that we're often disciplined is for education. For education, again, the book of Job, that's kind of what it's about. Job goes through all of this immense suffering, loss of his family, loss of his health. And, and at the end of the book, at the conclusion of it, you know, spoiler alert, if you haven't read it, go read it. But Job says, look, before my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. And so Job says that at the conclusion of all this, he got an education in God, that part of the purpose for the suffering was that he was supposed to go through some things so that he could better understand who God is, how God works, how much he loves him, what God is up to. The suffering, in other words, was just a, a, part, of, a part of education. There are some things, I fundamentally believe this, there are some things about God that will only be learned in the crucible of discipline. There's no other way the human heart is too corrupted. Our desires are, are, are too conflicted. We will always run as fast as we can to comfort and to ease and to security and to whatever massages the ego. And so in order for God to teach us certain things about himself, sometimes we have to go through some really hard things. Sometimes he has to discipline us. In other words, the only way we can truly be educated in the things of God is to, is to suffer. One of my favorite books that I read, I don't know, five, six years ago, was written by David Brooks, the guy who writes a lot, um, and it's called The Second Mountain, and kind of the premise of the book is that David Brooks says that around 50, he got knocked off the first mountain of life, and he says the first mountain of life is the mountain that everyone climbs. It's the mountain of ego and accomplishment and success. It's the mountain of, of accruing you know, financial rewards and material possessions, and he, he had a, a number of things happen in his life, a number of catastrophes and disasters and difficulties. Difficulties that knocked him off that mountain. And he says the second mountain is the mountain that you only discover when you wander in the wilderness of wondering who you really are. And he says, for those of us who are lucky enough to find it, those of us who are lucky enough to get knocked off the mountain of ego and to realize there's a second mountain to climb, and it's the mountain where you give your life away. 
That's the language of someone who's been educated, I think, and the way that God would use discipline to shape and instruct a life such that they can better understand God. I've put the graphic up here before, so I won't do it this morning, but you've seen it, right? The, the, the idea, this is your comfort zone, and then this is where you grow, and those two circles have never once overlapped in the history of the human species. Never has your comfort zone and your growth been in the same place. It's always in a place where it's hard and difficult, where the most growth happens. We talked about this last week, physical exertion. You're only getting better if you feel weaker. You're only growing whenever you're stretched. You're only learning about God when you go through discipline in a particular way. So again, I give you those purposes not to say whatever you're going through should be you know, minimized by them, but it should be understood in light of those things. I mean, I've been pastoring here almost 17 years. I know a lot of y'all, and I know your stories, and some of y'all are going through some really hard things. And my prayer would be is if we listen to the book of Hebrews this morning, we realize that, okay, first thing I need to think in the midst of this, God is treating me as a son or a daughter. He's not punishing me because he wants me to flee. He's wooing me by his love to show me he's a father who, who cares about my character. He cares about my ethics. He cares about my heart. And discipline is a way that he shows me that. He may be correcting something in your life. Maybe there is something that you've put on the shelf and said, okay, God, you can have all of this, but not that. That's my hobby. That, that's my thing. That's, that's for me and me only. And God's saying, no, you're going to go through discipline so that we can talk about that, so we can deal with that. Or maybe this morning it's just merely an education, an up-close encounter with the person of the Lord as he carries you through a difficult stretch and season. I don't know what it is, but those are some purposes. And if we will let them have their, if we will let discipline have its way, then it will produce something in us. There's a product of discipline that we need to think about this morning as well. It's meant to do something, to shape something in us. Verse 7, it is for discipline that you have to endure. It is for discipline that you have to go through this process to build up endurance. Again, back in verse 3, consider him, who is Jesus, who endured such hostility from sinners. So consider how Jesus' endurance shows us how by trusting in him in the midst of discipline, we grow as a resilient people who are able to endure all sorts of things, all sorts of things. Discipline is for endurance, and endurance can only be developed amidst discipline. And this flies directly in the face of all of our cultural values, our values of comfort and safety and ease and happiness. We can't conceive of a God who would both love us and call us to endurance, to take us to, to the brink of our ability so that we have to trust in him, so that we can grow in him. And, and I'll just be honest this morning. If, if we buy that cultural line, if we, if, we, if we buy into the American ideals of comfort, ease, and happiness, the suburban ideals that says all you really need is a privacy fence and a garage door opener and closer, and you can... You can cocoon your life in such a way so that you can have life on your terms. If we buy that today, and if we, especially if we, if we pass that on to our kids, we're going to create for ourselves all sorts of problems. Like the Forest Service trying to protect the trees from the fire, only killing them off in the process, so too will our lives. It will shrivel up and die. We only develop endurance. We only develop resilience when we go through discipline. One of my favorite books that I've read on this in the last little bit was uh, The Coddling of the American Mind by Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff. They're, they're social psychologists who had studied kind of what's happening in, in high schools and college campuses with um, what would be considered like the way we're becoming increasingly fragile as a species and how we can't seem to even handle hard, hard words anymore. So we've got to, you know, bubble wrap our lives and, and always try to avoid anything that, that challenges us or, or causes us uh, some measure of hardship. And in their book, they talk a lot about how the American mind has been shaped by that. These, neither one of these guys are Christians, by the way, but they just talk about, man, we've got to deal with this problem as a people. And here's what they say. They say, a culture that allows the concept of safety to creep so far that it equates emotional discomfort with visual, physical danger is a culture that encourages people to systematically protect one another from the very experiences embedded in daily life that they need in order to become strong and healthy. So a culture that cocoons everyone to keep, where we equate emotional discomfort with physical danger is essentially calling all people to avoid the things that will actually grow us and make us a people who, who can endure things. And this is how they frame it. I love this because this is all about discipline. He says, from time to time in the years to come, 
I hope you will be treated unfairly so that you will come to know the value of justice. I hope that you will suffer betrayal because that will teach you the importance of loyalty. Sorry to say, but I hope you will be lonely from time to time so that you don't take friends for granted. I wish you bad luck again from time to time so that you will be conscious of the role of chance in life and understand that your success is not completely deserved and that the failure of others is not completely deserved either. I hope you'll be ignored so that you know the importance of listening to others and I hope you'll have just enough pain to learn compassion. Whether I wish these things or not, they're going to happen and whether you benefit from them or not will depend upon your ability to see the message in your misfortunes. That's not one of the messages I like to preach necessarily. Hey, I hope you go through some really hard things. But like he says, you're going to go through hard things. The question is, will you be able to endure? And in going through those hard things, will your endurance increase? Will will your resilience increase? The author of Hebrews says it's for discipline that we have to endure. It's by encountering these things that we learn the value of, first off, who Jesus is and what his suffering means. Not only that, he says, it's in the midst of this that we share in God's holiness. Look back at verse 10. Uh, For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. In other words, there's something about the holiness of God that is only attainable to us as we endure and as we go through hard things. The holiest people I know, and I've checked this. I went through this last night in my mind. Okay, think of the people who I believe are the holiest people I know. You know what they all have in common? They all have suffered mightily. The people I know who I look at and I'm like, I wish I could be more like them. Not just in their their character and their conduct, but in their reverence for God and in the way that they approach life. Man, all of them, without exception, have gone through something really, really hard. Or maybe you're even in the midst of it at this moment. That if we allow the discipline of God to drive us towards his person and his likeness towards Jesus, we share in his holiness. And then he says, we also get the peaceful fruit of righteousness. There's some blessed assurance that comes from having all of our pretense stripped through discipline. Verse 11, for the moment, for at the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Now, The only way that's going to happen for you or me is not just if we understand why God would allow us to to go through discipline or even if we yearn for the product of discipline to show up in our lives. The only way all this happens is if we fix our eyes on Jesus, the person of discipline. If we look unto him, we see that he took on this cross and scorned its shame and he's seated at the right hand of God. If we look unto him, if we consider him so we don't grow weary and lose heart. The person of discipline is the only way we're going to make it through all this. What does that mean, though? What does it mean to fix your eyes on Jesus? What does it mean to look unto him? What does it mean to consider him? Well, first off, we have to see he's the only truly unjust sufferer. As one theologian has said before, uh, we often ask the question, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, that only happened once, and he volunteered for it. And to the extent that we can see the truth in that, that that Jesus is truly the only unjust sufferer, the only one who was perfect in all of his form, majesty, and being, who who was sinless in in everything, and then suffered to the nth degree in a way that we can't even conceive of, only then can we make sense of whatever it is we may be enduring in this moment. The Apostle Peter did this, by the way, in the scriptures for us, so we don't have to speculate about what it means to consider him who endured from, host- from, from sinners such hostility against himself. Peter actually did this. In, second, in 1 Peter chapter 2, this is what Peter writes. He says, For this is a gracious thing, when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For to this you have been called. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but you have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Only when that sinks in, only when we get that down into the depth of our souls, can we look at whatever it is that we're going through and say, the unjust 
the, 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 the truly unjust suffering that happened happened to Jesus first. And in that, then I can find endurance. In that, then I can find perseverance. In that, then I can find love and comfort and grace. Only through that. And when you do that, you'll realize that he is, in fact, the lover of your soul. That it's not, it's, it's, discipline is not contrary to God's love. It's a part of his love. It's a part of the way that he shapes us. It's a part of the way that he forms us. It's a part of the way that he even reveals how much he cares for us. It's only when we are dealing with abject loneliness can we really truly know what it means when he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. It's only when we're in immense pain that we can realize what Jesus went through whenever he said, Father, if there be any way for this cup to pass through me, let it be so. Nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. It's only whenever we've been abandoned by our friends and and allies, that we can see what Jesus felt when he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. In all of these ways, it's only in the experience of suffering that we can really see how much he truly loves us and cares for us. Hymn writer John Newton, he had a best friend named William Cooper. Cooper wrote a bunch of hymns, too. And um, Cooper uh, suffered from r- really terrible mental illness. Uh, he was always in some form of depression. And if you ever get a chance to read about their relationship, Newton cared for him. He was an Anglican priest. He cared for Cooper as a, as a dear friend throughout all the suffering of his life. But Cooper wrote a few really meaningful hymns. And he wrote one particular hymn uh, about the, the, the mystery of, of suffering. And God moves in mysterious ways, I think is the, the title of the hymn. And it's more like a poem. But uh, it was how he tried to wrestle with this fact that he had had this really, really hard life, debilitating mental illness, ongoing depression, and how does he make sense of that in light of who God is? And I think it's here where you see this coalescence of, of both the love of God and the pain of real life kind of coming together in, in a beautiful way. Cooper writes this, God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never-failing skill, he fashions up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds that you much dread are big with mercy and will break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste but sweet will be the flower. So God, would you captivate our minds and our hearts with that image today? That it's in the midst of discipline that we know that you're near to us, that you care for us, that you love us, that you're treating us as sons or daughters. And Lord, that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. And Lord, there's a lot of pain that showed up in this room today. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of dread and anxiety. There's a lot of feeling overwhelmed and burdened by many things. And so, Lord, I pray that we can bring all of that to you today, knowing that you are the lover of our souls, the only truly unjust sufferer, and you'll meet us there. And then in experience a death like Christ, we'll also experience a resurrection like his as well. That's what we ask and hope for in Jesus' name. Amen.